The beautiful thing about input latency is not a lot. It's not a particularly fun subject. Ideally, you don't even want it to exist. But my last video on this subject brought out people's imaginations, and I got a few interesting suggestions and many not so interesting ones for how I could further my input latency testing. But first I need to clear up some myths, which, reading the comments, it seems some of you are confused about. I was told I couldn't have tested CS2's input latency accurately because the gun's muzzle flash in-game is delayed. Firstly, that's been fixed now, but second, I wasn't testing the muzzle flash. I was testing this flashing box, though there was a segment where I compared it with the muzzle flash latency. I was also told that by testing the flashing box on screen, I wasn't actually testing the game's input latency and was testing general system latency instead. But that isn't the case. This box represents the game's latency, which is why its latency changes as the in-game settings do and, and as I change my hardware and so on. It's worth describing what this box represents. It only appears in Reflex-supported games, where Nvidia has gone and implemented the feature into the game itself, and so this flashing box can be seen as a way for them to validate the game's latency when compared to other testing methods. What this means for the end user using this Reflex Flash feature is that when the mouse is clicked, the game tags that action, follows it through the pipeline, and when it reaches the end, it tells Nvidia's driver to draw a white square on the frame the game has told it to. Hence game latency. So yes, this box on screen can be trusted, and it's just a more reliable way of testing the game's input latency than an in-game animation may be. With all that cleared up, I can get on to the next question. How does CSGO's latency compare to CS2's? Unfortunately, CSGO doesn't support this reflex flashing box, which makes direct comparisons more difficult to achieve. I ended up testing CS2, CSGO, and Counter-Strike Source at 4 times speed, firing shots into this wall, measuring the muzzle flash, blah blah. And the reason I didn't go any better than this is because Counter-Strike Source lacks several of the commands required for that. And here were the results, which will surprise and or anger you. Because surely the oldest game, running at the fastest, highest frame rates, should get the least latency. It seems like Valve has fixed all the delayed muzzle flare issues that CS2 used to have, because it now gets the best input latency of the lot, so when you fire a gun, its muzzle flash is instant now. Take away from all this testing that all Counter-Strike games tested can feel incredibly responsive if configured correctly, even this newest one on the more demanding Source 2 engine. VSync was a surprisingly controversial topic. I'll just test it all for myself and get to the bottom of it. Now this guy here said that there was hardware and software VSync, which was news to me and indeed the engineers that I asked about this. But there is an element of truth to this, which is that some games work better when you enable VSync in Nvidia's control panel, while others work better with in-game implementations, especially games with Reflex, which require that information from the game itself in order to aid in its frame pacing. So because of all that, it's probably better to use the VSync option in-game rather than in Nvidia's control panel, because it may be that the game devs have added some custom tweaks to it to help it to run better. As for CS2's VSync, I found no difference between enabling it in Nvidia's control panel and the in-game option. Both came out at 14 milliseconds average latency, versus 8 without VSync of any sort. Don't have VSync on if you want the lowest latency. I also tested the fast option in Nvidia's control panel. This doesn't cap the frame rate to the monitor's refresh rate like standard VSync does, but does away with the tearing simply by not showing another frame until the current one has finished being displayed on screen. And this dropped latency down to just 9 milliseconds. To me, this makes fast the no-brainer if you really hate tearing but don't want the latency of proper VSync. I don't know how it will perform in other games and on other setups, but testing that would be a whole video onto itself, which about five of you might actually care about. So let's move on to the next test instead. Some of you swore by a setup where you use G-Sync and V-Sync at the same time, but cap your frame rate to below the monitor's refresh rate, which means that V-Sync can't kick in anyway. Understanding these results requires a bit of common sense. Having G-Sync on and V-Sync off resulted in the lowest latency, but I may as well have not had G-Sync on because it only kicks in if the frame rate goes below the monitor's refresh rate, which isn't happening on my PC. The worst latency was from using G-Sync with an uncapped frame rate but with V-Sync on because it's always running into that V-Sync limitation. The best results I got were from using the FPS max command to limit the frame rate to the monitor's refresh rate, and this helped because it prevented VSync from ever kicking in and delaying stuff. I got marginally better results from capping it a few FPS below the refresh rate, just to make sure VSync doesn't kick in. And as you may expect, capping it to just 240 FPS wasn't so good because the frame rate in general is too low to be any more responsive. Some of the confusion regarding G-Sync and V-Sync seems to come from this Battle Nonsense video where he appears to get tearing despite using G-Sync with a capped frame rate. This can occur when the game isn't consistently limiting the frame rate to below the monitor's refresh rate. However, because the tearing only seems to occur at the very bottom of the screen, it could very well be a monitor firmware issue, or even a G-Sync bug. But generally, V-Sync shouldn't be needed to stop tearing if G-Sync is active. 
provided the frame rate is below your monitor's refresh rate. In theory, upscalers like FSR and DLSS may add latency because it takes some time to do the effect. In theory. In practice, whatever latency they do add is more than offset by how much they improve your frame rate by, and I can say now enabling FSR never made my input latency worse. Generally, if it improves your frame rate, then it will improve your input latency as well, and it greatly helped my minimum spec PC when I was using settings that were enough to slow it down, which is where you'd want to enable FSR anyway. This was more for my own curiosity, but can you have energy efficiency and low latency? Short answer, not really. Long answer, it's complicated, but pay attention because you might learn something. With me using an Intel 3900K and GeForce 4090, two of the most power-hungry components ever to exist, me talking about power efficiency sounds like a bad joke. But bear with me, because more power can sometimes enable better efficiency, and it's why, even though they could theoretically consume more than 700 watts, in CS2, these two components combined never go beyond 200. As an example of why this is, to reach 180 FPS, a slower graphics card might have to work at 100% power, which may consume 100 or even 200 watts. But the GeForce 4090 is such a beast, it can achieve 180 FPS consuming just 20 watts. I would say that in gaming, the graphics card is generally the component that will be consuming the most power, so you'll consume the least power in games in CPU limited situations. These situations are CPU limited, and these ones aren't maxing out either component, hence why this 400 watt graphics card is never consuming more than 100 watts of power. But my processor is also notoriously power hungry. The 3900K can consume upwards of 300 watts. So why is it never using more than 100 in CS2? Well that's because gaming can't max out all of the processor's cores, nor its power consumption budget, and you will probably be in the same situation. How can this be? That's because games tend to be limited by the speed of your fastest processor core. And sure, multi-threaded games like CS2 will use some of the other ones as well, so it helps to have a 6 or 8 core processor, but CS2 still won't come close to maxing out all of them. That's why you've got to be wary of trying to read these figures to see which component is bottlenecking your PC. Your processor doesn't have to be pegged at 100% for your system to be processor limited. A better way of knowing if your CPU limited is if your frame rate is uncapped and your graphics card isn't running at 100%. So you figured out that it's your processor holding you back. How do you get better performance? Your best hope is to upgrade to a faster processor, with a faster, fastest core. Anyway, none of these results I got are that power hungry, so I'll probably still just want to game at uncapped frame rates simply to get the lowest latency possible. But out of curiosity, I got the power consumption and the average latencies and multiplied them together into this fictional metric, where ideally the smaller the number the better the trade-off between power consumption and input latency, though it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But using this fictional metric, I noticed Reflex Plus Boost was actually doing something to improve input latency when the game was capped to 360 FPS but it came at an excessively increased power consumption. And using my particular components, the best power efficiency result I got was to cap the frame rate at double my monitor's refresh rate. But remember, this metric is something I just made up, so take it with a pinch of salt. My lifetime encounters with the term Nyquist theorem more than doubled thanks to my input latency video. I stated in that that you'd want a video camera that can capture at least the same frame rate as your monitor is for accurate response time readings. But the Nyquist theorem states that you'd want at least double. But neither is correct, because pixels don't just instantly refresh, so the more frames a second you can capture your footage at, the more accurate your input latency measurements will be. The LDAT unit that I'm using measures at 8800 FPS, so this isn't a problem for my testing. Some monitors support ultra-low motion blur, which can make the screen appear even more responsive than it actually is. I can't say I've had any issues with how the 360Hz screen looks at default settings, but ULMB claims to make it look as sharp as a 1440Hz screen would look, and with it on, it dropped the latency down to just 6 milliseconds, the best result I've ever got. But what am I really measuring here? ULMB works by making the screen go black between every refresh, which greatly reduces the blurring as pixels transition from one to the next. That's how it can make motion look more responsive, and I suspect it's this flickering that the LDAT unit is measuring here. So even though I scored just 6 milliseconds of input latency, I doubt that ULMB is actually making the game any more responsive, but it's still a nice feature to have and to use. And last, some smartass tried to diss wireless mice by stating that a nearby microwave could interfere with it. Yeah, like anyone's going to be gaming near a microwave. Starting with the microwave off, I got very good latency readings, as you might expect. But then I turned the microwave on and, oh look, I'm still getting good latency readings, and a warm snack to boot. Look, I can even move the mouse to the other side of the microwave and the receiver is still consistently picking up on it straight away. I didn't try testing with my mouse inside the microwave, as that may interfere with the signal slightly more. 
In conclusion, wireless mice are fine and you don't need to concern yourself about preventing any electrical inveterance by scanning every item individually or anything like that. 